Hi everyone, welcome back to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. On this episode, I'm delighted to talk with someone who has actually had me on uh, a podcast that he co-hosts. Uh, and in this case, I'm talking with author, creator, Matt Faulkner. May I call you Matt? Is that okay? Please do, All Jason. Right. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Um, well, I, I usually start these by mentioning a couple of works. So you create in the world of picture books, which I love, as well as graphic novels. And so I'll mention, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, but guide you, American Prisoner of War, My Nest of Silence, The Moon Clock. Those are just a couple of your works that I've been reviewing in preparation for this talk. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, Gai Jin is, I was corrected when I, I asked George Takei to uh, do the voiceover for it. Um, Gai Jin is not an easy word for me to say. I, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, you you did a good job. Thank you. No, well, absolutely. Absolutely. We try. We try. Uh, I typically ask sort of an origin story at the beginning, something about what makes comics unique or um, how you connected with the medium. And so I'm curious about how you knew comics, but then also because we're talking picture books, uh, visuals in general were, were kind of the space that you wanted to connect with. Um, I think I'm, well, first and foremost, um, the, uh, the avenue into visual storytelling to me in terms of uh, comics was uh, Mad Magazine. <laughs> that was, uh, and Mort Drucker in particular, I just, uh, his work um, is magical for me I, as a kid. But also, you know, um, Charles M. Schultz uh, before Mad Magazine. Um, but both of those, Mort Drucker and Charles M. Schultz, they were my, you know, uh, mentors, uh, not actually present but uh influencing me and in and in just looking at what they did was it was fascinating to me um so you know without knowing it um charles m schultz just taught me that this is how you tell stories mm -hmm. um, as a seven-year-old um I, god i remember being one of my birthday gifts uh a long time ago probably when i was like eight or nine was my mom took me to a store and let me buy a bunch of charles and you know uh, peanuts books and that was my gift you know uh and i was delighted um so that early on um but it wasn't it wasn't necessarily because um i was a reader first and then oh man i gotta go over to visual storytelling and it's got to be you no know, no i I have to say too, probably it was um, uh, Chuck Jones and um, Bugs Bunny uh, uh -huh. and Wiley e. Coyote and uh, Yosemite Sam. That all pretty much, that's all I needed as a kid right there, that that was the avenue in for me. Yeah. Um, and I think that it definitely uh, word, letter, construction for communicating uh sentences and so forth that didn't come to me till later i mean i had to do it um but it wasn't until i read i think i was in middle school the hobbit oh yeah mm -hmm. um i couldn't care less about reading and my grades showed that uh <laughs> but then i think a librarian maybe it was ninth grade or something like this a librarian in a library sat me down and said look i think you're going to find this interesting and it was at that point that words actually took on value to me because i could already see the things and i wanted to make them I, um but who knew that people wrote stories that had giants and trolls and these things hobbits and uh -huh. tree weird i mean for god's sakes um, you mean people do this as a job and they get paid? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, that <laughs> sounds like a job I could want. All the other stuff sounded like, no, I don't want to be an accountant. <laughs> you right. know, or whatever this letters and numbers stuff leads to. So that's kind of a lengthy uh, answer, but um, I hope that helps. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And you're just taking me back to a time that I, w I was an eighth grade uh, teacher at one point, an English teacher, and The Hobbit was one of the books that I brought into my classroom. Just love that book. And uh, what a world builder in Tolkien. I mean, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that. And you're absolutely speaking so well to that 
that initial connection, that way in that uh, readers find. So I love that. Yeah, it was it was the spark, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I have a friend who comes from an indigenous culture. He's passed away, but you know, his thing was always look. Every child in his culture comes with a gift, uh-huh. and it's the the culture's job to find out what that gift is because that's going to help everybody else. But they th- saw every child as being this, you know, like from the other side, this great boon to the community. And I remember learning too, and I'll, I may mention this later too, but when I heard uh, Dr. Um, Gardner, Har- Harold Gardner from Harvard, uh-huh. uh, talking about bra- brain smarts, you know, and that the brain that we address in children, if we don't address the whole bl- brain, then we're not only limiting that child, but we're limiting our community. So when we set up a, a, a system that says it's all letters and numbers, and that's what's important, and we don't talk to image making smarts, uh, spatial smarts, movement smarts, feeling smarts, um, no, no surprise that, you know, we have limitations as a culture. Mm-hmm. True. So that I didn't learn that until <laughs> well into my 40s, but uh, 50s, actually, I hear from him. But when I put those two together, yes, that's what happened to me is I found out that grownups, there were some grownups that saw that visual storytelling, which is what I do from the get go, was good. Uh-huh. That librarian gave me that blessing, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and as a as an education center podcast, love that message as well. Uh, shout out to wonderful librarians out there that are making those connections all the time. Absolutely. I mean, without being too dramatic, Jason, in a way, yeah, it saved my life. It uh-huh. gave my life direction and therefore helped me feel like it was okay for me to be me in this world. Yeah. And it was early on direction. I had an English teacher who did something similar, who simply said, you know, you have a thing, do it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And probably those two things and some other people led me to say, yeah, I could actually go to art college. It's yeah. kind of crazy. How am I going to get a job? Um, but I did. And yeah. get out of my way. Once that started to happen. <laughs> Yeah. for good or bad i don't know but you know it's it's ended up how you know it's the path to how i got here love that we're still yeah. talking to you about this stuff yeah yeah um so I, i've as i mentioned i've looked back through your work and i was curious about the kinds of stories that you're drawn to now as a creator because uh you, you have work that's very fable like in a way and then you also have really interesting sort of like um social directed work as well really pointing out issues in the world exploring issues and and kind of sharing messages for young readers well thank you for mm-hmm. seeing that um yeah fable myth very important to me i once heard a storyteller say that myth was uh, actually soul maps soul maps and i love that metaphor um and that uh Certainly going to people like um, Joseph Campbell and uh, any kind of mythological investigation, uh, Jungian therapy, uh, so forth and so on, has fascinated me. Always has from uh, probably being introduced to that. Um, when was I introduced? I don't know, like in college? And then moving into social things, it really was um, the response to 9-11 by some people that made me want to look at my own family's history, distant family really, but um, and then see how um, I have to see everybody as my family. Um, so uh, it, otherwise, what am I doing here? Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. And, and it may sound a little bit... Um, Oh, I don't know what it sounds like, but it, it was important to me after 9-11 when I started to hear, that's the moment when I started to hear people say that um, perhaps we should be imprisoning uh, Muslim Americans, that I remembered that my great aunt, who's Irish American, had um, had a Japanese American family. She uh, lived in Tokyo for a while and uh, had a child, and that child had children. And right after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, her family was informed that they had to uh, go to the uh, 
prison camp, Manzanar. Yeah. My aunt Adeline didn't have to go. She was Irish American, but uh, her children were going. So she said, you're not taking my kids and my grandkids without me. So she ended up going. And um, Adeline Nishimura uh, and her daughter Mary and their children. So that was the thing right then. When I heard that, I thought, man, if I don't start talking about this now, I could always say, well, I'd rather just keep doing myths. Um, those are important, but they keep me out of the discourse where people might get angry at me mm -hmm. for talking about these things. Um, and I realized I, I can't afford to do that. I have to... Um, I have this cachet, you know, this um, earned, I, uh, like Paul Simon said, because of my sex uh, and my um, skin tone, I get to, uh, my checks are accepted at the door. Uh -huh, <laughs> you know? uh -huh. And so I, I can't not do this. I didn't know what it was going to do. I don't know that it's had much of any effect, but it was important for me to do have these two books, uh, My Nest of Silence and Gaijin, American Prisoner of War, which are both about the Japanese-American internment. But I also did a picture book for really six to eight-year-olds called A Taste of Colored Water, which uh -huh. was about two white kids that wanted to get a, a drink of uh, colored water. They heard that there was a water fountain in the city that had the word colored over it. And um, that came out in 2008. And that's still in print on the shelves kind of unfortunately too because we still have to talk about these things um and rightly so um but yeah it's wish it wish it wasn't a necessity but i believe it is so i'm glad that i, I you know i'm like i'm in it i i've done what i could do uh, i'm not going to i'm going to continue doing what i can do in that regard but i don't want to limit myself either i want to do picture books that are also about um modern myth um I'm writing a story, a graphic novel right now about a boy who is in a culture where drawing is illegal. Oh, wow. Yeah. And scribblers are the ones who uh, get uh, chastised by the kindness council for scribbling. And uh, so that that's the nature of that story. Uh, we'll see what happens with that one. But to me, that's like me trying to take what's going on now and put it into a mythic um, experience. Uh-huh. And play, so that's what, you know, if we go down that road, like what what is interesting to me, I want to play with both um, esoteric, mythical things and yeah. reality, uh, historical. And I've been trying not to get the two confused, but now I'm, I, I want to uh, kind of weave them together and going forward and see how that plays out too. Yeah, well, that's the the beauty of the parable, because you can talk about something that's mythic and something that's close at the same time. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, it's gorgeous. I love playing with that. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing that book as it comes together. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Um. So curious about. I, I typically ask about kind of the connections, the relationships, the experiences that have been positive in the journey that have really kind of shaped your work as you've gone. Um, a couple of them. One of them is uh, early on. Uh, I was a bit of a troublemaker and my with my brother, we would watch Dennis the Menace and then I would do bad things after the show was over <laughs> following Dennis's um, model. And my mother um, made me when I come home, came home after school for quite a while, sit down and draw. My brother could go watch Dennis the Menace because he wasn't doing that stuff, but I had to sit down and draw. And that, became a way of expressing myself that I'm not sure I would have, it, it anchored in, in me, you know, first of all, I was ticked off because I wanted to watch Dennis, but on, then it became like, okay, I can't do what I want. Let me funnel it through this. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I probably drew some irritating drawings, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's one of them. Another one was again, a, a blessing, um, a blessing from a teacher, uh, where we were reading, uh, I think it was Huckleberry Finn. And the teacher asked who, uh, if we saw Huckleberry Finn as heroic, and th there is a part in there that to this day, you know, and I've heard it talked about later too, where uh, Huckleberry is torn because he can't figure out whether or not he's going to turn in his friend Jim. Uh -huh. as a runaway slave it's been 
uh, condition in him since he was a baby, probably, that that's what you have to do. So for him to stop and say, wait a minute, is this right? He's my friend. Um, and he's also, you know, there, there was also a thing. It was like, he th I, I'll go to hell. I mean, that's what he thought would happen. Uh -huh. And he makes that decision in the story. Well, I guess I'm going to hell because I'm not turning Jim in. Yeah. And the teacher asked the students, you know, who in the class reminds you of Huckleberry Finn? Now, I don't really know if I was, <laughs> I have that kind of heroicism at all. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not sure why she thought that I did, but she said, yeah, I think Matt is the person that reminds me of that. Wow. Yeah. To give me that kind of, you know, it probably put a target on me for some of the other kids <laughs> to harass me afterwards. But it also, I would say it was a blessing. It was a saying, I, I see you, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, and I, I never forgot it. And it's something that I can look back on and go, yeah, I can keep on do being me. It's okay for me to be me. It's okay for me that I have some gifts that I can use to help. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So those two things really, I mean, it may sound silly, but the fact that I had to sit at the table and just draw for periods of time, half an hour, it seemed like forever sometimes, I'm sure. But then also to have a teacher who said, um, I see you and everyone look, that's Matt. And that's, that's his uh, blessing. Um, those were important. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a friend named Paul who is also a teacher and that's one of his uh, essential parts of his class. He, he always talks about how he wants his students to know that they're seen and to sort of communicate in some way. I see you today. I see you out there. I like that's why I like that blessing eye thing. We've heard also of the cursing eye. And mm -hmm. I think that so often um because we have um directive that comes down from someplace that says, you know, so many tests have to be taken, so much time has to be sent prepping for that, spent prepping for that test. Um that the ignoring of giving a child a blessing. Mm -hmm. actually then becomes a curse i yeah. was ignored nobody saw me we spent a lot of time doing what the system said i was supposed to do but nobody saw my gifts that can start to become kind of like a curse yeah because you never know who you are mm -hmm. what you're good at true true yeah and that, that speaks so well to the visual, too, of getting to share these images, getting to share these ideas, and really putting things in place in the world around us. Yeah, it's just, and, and it's not to say that um, it would be good if we started to pay attention to visual storytelling and visual processing so we can help the artists. That would be nice. Uh -huh. But really, what I think what I think is important to me, and I think it's what Dr. Gardner was saying, is that we need to do that for the math smart and the science smart and the language smart kids too. Because uh -huh. like the guy who discovered the helix, if he couldn't imagine that shape, how was he going to – he had to sketch it. Right. Right? So he saw things um, in, space, in space. And that's – for some people, that's a learned – practice some people can't see things in their mind that way but they could be um given practice in that just like not so very good at trigonometry over here um, <laughs> same here <laughs> really got, got good at it either but um i do like there are aspects of math that i needed to work on that became pleasure pleasant to me I, I like to think about things um mathematically some sometimes not a lot but mm -hmm. you know it's, it's, it's just this balance in terms of what we focus on yeah yeah as educators but as, as a writer and creator um how do you think about that difference between creating picture books and creating comics what, what's that process and sort of back and forth like for you well i teach picture books have i taught comics I'm, I'm, I've been asked to teach comics at the Holland, uh, Hollands University this summer. Oh, nice, nice. So I'm going to do that. 
and uh, I'm going to do graphic novels and picture books, uh, two different uh, courses. So um, the for me, one of the things in terms of teaching it, um, and I've taught at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit and also the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, primarily character development, environment development, world building as applied to uh, children's books. Mm -hmm. um, both of them, for me, are about making movies. That's mm -hmm. all they are. Mm -hmm. A picture book primarily is 32 keyframes. Right. And then yeah. the page turn and everything in between is what the reader makes in their mind to make the connecting imagery in between. Mm -hmm. So I'm just making 32 images and the words also help. But, you know, if it's a picture book, it's about um, guiding, driving, um, giving inspiration for whatever the reader can come up with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then graphic novels just multiply that exponentially. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I'm going to have a character here reaching over here and then eventually um, grabbing something in a picture book, I don't get to put those three in there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Graphic novel, I get to have more than just those 32 keyframes. And so it becomes even more um, delectable, yummy, yeah. uh -huh. at both the process and viewing. What is left in and what is left out is the poetry of a graphic novel. Yeah, I love that. Very well said. So that's what's interesting. Thank you. That's what's interesting to me about both of those. I think that they, there's not, they're, they're, don't tell people this, but I mean, the first <laughs> two books, well, this people know the first two books, The Moon Clock was one of them. The other one was um, uh, The Amazing Voyage of Jackie Grace that I did. They were graphic novels. Jackie mm -hmm. Grace came out in 1986. And uh, I don't know how they let it get through because back then, Oh no, not not comic books. Those aren't going in libraries, but they were. They were panels. They had speech balloons. Oops. Yeah, it didn't yeah. stop me, so I did it. You you were hybridizing text way before it was a thing. It's I just was <laughs> having fun. That's I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do it, and they didn't stop me. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I love that interplay, how sometimes you can see something that it's like, oh, that's kind of comic-like, but it's in a picture book. So I love that uh, way that they can both sort of overlap a little bit. And that's one of the things, too, about the latest graphic novel that I did is they let me write more words this time, too. So it's about a 300-page book, I think, and like 100 pages of it are written. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. My Nest of Silence. And so I... I like that amalgam kind of um, experience. Yeah. Um, I know that it may kind of push the edges of the envelope for people who are, um, a, a, you know, have a real appreciation, a love for the comic way. Um, like I said, I was in, I looked at Mad Magazine. I don't know a lot of the names of the great comic artists. I just don't. Yeah. I know more Drucker. I, <laughs> that's, that's what I know. And Charles Schultz, and um, it's very limited uh, inspiration, but it's potent. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so to me, that kind of, um, this is what I see, a word picture amalgam that is graphic novel, novel mashup. And again, they just let me make it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what else happens. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. love it. Uh, and I say pushing the envelope in good directions because uh, I just love when creators work across uh, media, I guess you can say, or forms that way. Uh, it's, it's always interesting to me. Yeah, me too. I really think that um, I like meat and potatoes. Well, that's not a good way to put it. <laughs> I like what is accepted as a picture book. Uh -huh. um, they're the ones that are really successful to me that follow a a, a more conservative interpretation of it I'm not going to deny those I'm right. not going to but I also want to see the ones that are um, that push the edges of that envelope um, 
and they get to live together on the same bookshelves uh -huh, uh -huh. for me. And I, and I want to support that. That's the kind of experimentation that is going to lead children to saying, okay, they walked out on the limb and were supported and felt safe within their uh, creative community. I can too. And yeah. that will lead us to the kind of growth that would be, I think, appreciated. Uh -huh. That's what I want to see. So, yeah, I'm, I go back and forth. I don't, I'm not like constantly trying to push the edges of the envelope. Sometimes I'm just illustrating. Uh, I've been hired to do a job for somebody. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They want the envelope. <laughs> yeah. Pay the rent. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, um, but it, it's all, yeah, it's, it's what I love to do. And I really, Jason, I can't imagine doing it. I don't, I've thought about it every once in a while when times got lean, like during the pandemic, or I was a little old for these questions then, but certainly, er, certainly earlier in my life, what else could I do? Uh -huh. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> There's not a lot else that I can do. So I, I, I just have to keep doing this visual yeah. storytelling. Yeah. Um, well, you said you're working on a new graphic novel. Anything else that is on the horizon that you can talk about, would want to talk about before we close? I'm doing another picture book with my wife and her ground dog, uh, Groundhog's Dilemma Universe. Love uh, it. This love the it. third book in that in that group. So this is fun. The the next one's coming out in May, um, called uh, Squirrel Needs a Break. Uh, it's about a single squirrel dad with three little kits that are just driving them a little bit crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the community shows up and says, hey, you know what? We'll take them for a day. I mean, how hard could that be? And we'll also take you out to have fun. And it's what happens during that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll leave that up to your imagination. May 7th is when that one comes out. Um, I'm working with two other writers uh, right now on potential projects um, they haven't sold yet. Um, I just um, signed with a new agent, Fuse Literary, and uh, Gordon Warnock is my agent. So uh, that's cool. That just happened this week. Nice, and nice. he's got these two stories. One of them is um, a book that came out in the late 80s called Always Running by um, Luis Rodriguez, who was the poet laureate for Los Angeles. And it's about um, his life. Um, and... Uh, the uh, Mexican-American experience um, a, 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 as a youth when he was a teenager. And it's uh, it's still on the shelves. It's it's a great story. And thinking about he wants to try to turn it into a graphic novel. So we're seeing who's going to bite on that. And mm -hmm. then the other one is Andrew Smith, who wrote uh, Grasshopper Jungle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He wrote uh, a novel that's a dystopian future surprise surprise but it's like right. a western so it's kind of it's this quirky you know like he like he would it's it's pushing the edges of the envelope so we're trying to do a i'm hoping it's an amalgam of his written word and my graphic novel for this uh this so those those are the works that i'm hoping get kicked into the next gear love it love it very cool looking forward to all of that um, if I'm a listener out there and I want to go to a particular space to see your work, to check things out, uh, where would the online spaces be that I might check out? Um, I think primarily just go to my website, mattfaulkner.com, two T's mm -hmm. and, um, at the end of Matt and, um, yeah, hang out there for a bit, see what you see. It's got, you know, the books that I've, I've uh, created and, you know, merchandise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, um, as you mentioned, uh, I have a um, a blog. I guess it's a blog. Is it a video blog? A vlog uh -huh. uh, with uh, Brian Ballinger uh, called the Calathumpian Parade, and it is about the um, the advent of AI and uh -huh. the effect as creative people feel about AI and what it's doing to creativity. So we have people like you, you were on there talking yes, yes. about what does this mean? What is it? Um, and it, that's been interesting and scary um, and then interesting and then scary uh, and then fun too, to really see this thing developing. We started back in October and it is, as everybody knows, moving like rockets um, through the culture. So the Calathumpian Parade on YouTube. 
well worth checking out. And and thanks for having me on your show as well. Absolutely. Yeah. That yeah. Was and great. I, that was I a hope good to return at some point. Yeah. We want you to come back. That would be great. It, yeah. And this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate being invited on. Jason. Absolutely. Glad to glad to have you back as you're working on projects. Uh, glad to have you back anytime to talk about collaborations, graphic novels, pushing the envelope, staying in the envelope. I love the envelope wherever you are on it. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you again, Matt. May the conversation continue. Yes, please do. Thank you, Jason. Be well. You too.